Welcome to Trek Table, your Sunday weekly podcast holding Trek space for Black, Indigenous, Brown, Women of Color, Queer or Otherwise, and our allies. Hey, what's up? And welcome to the Trek Table. I am your host, Allison Ordela, and I'm holding Trek space for all peoples who are living in occupied territories as they struggle for their own liberation. Hi, I am your co-host, Claudia, and I'm holding Trek space for believers who believe in a better way. Hi, I'm your co-host, Maya, and I'm holding Trek space for everyone who is trying something new and uh, looking for uh, ways to hold each other and connect. Hi, I'm your guest co-host, Maya Mama, and I'm holding Trek space for uh, those that are finding their way. Yes, yes, and we want to welcome everybody. We are holding lots of Trek Space today on this Sunday, May 16th, which is uh, happens to be our Sweet 16 episode of the Trek Table, recorded in front of our live digital audience here at twitch.tv slash outpost13 for the last time uh, in this season. We're so excited. Thanks to everybody who's watching us at uh, twitch.tv slash outpost13. Thanks to all our friends who are watching us at outpost13.org, or maybe you're watching us on the YouTube archive video or on our archived audio podcast. All right, so we've been asking folks who or what they are holding Trek Space for. The hosts are, are definitely holding a lot. There's a lot going on in the world. Um, so we're gonna continue to invite our friends in the chat to share with us today, what are you, who or what are you holding Trek Space for? Um, and as we um, prepare for all these things, we're thinking about all these things, let's go ahead and start this ritual. Uh, plant your feet flat on the floor and go ahead and take a breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Thank you. Our opening track for episode, this episode is titled Chicana Skies by the band Quetzal off their album Quetzal. You'll be hearing several tracks by Quetzal throughout the episode of Track Table, and you can follow them at Quetzal Music on Instagram and see our show notes or the chat link for their merchandise and more. Yes, yes. So we want to welcome you to episode 16 of the Track Table. As I mentioned earlier, I'm your host, Allison Ordela. We just want to say thank you so much for tuning in today to a conversation with women of color about Star Trek. We've been exploring Star Trek Discovery this uh, as we've launched our show. We're super to dig in and talk about it. Today we're going to talk about uh, the season finale of season one. And as we get into all the things, we just want to remind folks that there's probably going to be moments of conversation because of uh, events that have happened in the show and the way that we're also going to kind of maybe connect it out to the real world. We just want folks to make sure that you take care of yourselves. So we might have some conversations about uh, torture or abuse or rape. So we, we know that that can be triggering for some folks or questions for others. So we do want to ask you to take care of yourself in this process. Uh, Last kind of super fun announcement before we jump in. Uh, Trek Table Season 2 is going to launch on June 13th. So we're at May 16 right now, 2021. We're going to give ourselves three weeks off and come back and do a Season 1 recap. And then we're about to jump into Season 2 because we know Star Trek Discovery Season 4 is on its way. So June 13th. We'll say that a couple times this episode, and we want you to stay tuned until after Space Runway because we have a super special Star Trek guest sharing a super special announcement. Let's listen to a little bit of 20 pesos by the band Quetzal. And we are talking about Star Trek Discovery Season 1, Episode 15, Will You Take My Hand? Uh, we're going to explore this episode in a couple of different ways today on this Episode 16 of the Trek Table. We're going to look at it through Popcorn Recap, our favorite two-minute way to try to get the, the plot of this show recap just for you. We're going to jump into some Trek Table questions, which are already in the chat. Super excited to talk about those. Claudia is here to give us a, a pathway through some of the drama and discovery design. Maya's got some amazing space runway looks. We'll make that special announcement from that special Star Trek guest after space runway. We'll jump into thematics and braid it all together. We've got a major fun spoiler zone today because somebody got super excited in watching the season one finale and watched ahead. So 
super fun things in Spoiler Zone. Signal boost is filled with things. Final thoughts. And of course, we can't leave season one without some gratitude. We honor that people may be on their own journey of viewing Star Trek Discovery, so we'll only discuss the things that we can remember have been unveiled up through Season 1, Episode 15 of Star Trek Discovery. Amazing. All right, so let's go around and check in at this Trek, beautiful Trek table assembled today. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to invite us to go around, ask us to start with our name, our pronouns, any access check-in or visual description, and how do you identify as a Star Trek fan? Claudia, I'm going to ask you to go first. Hey, hello, everyone. This is Claudia Alec. Uh, gender pronouns, they, their, she, hers. I'm a black woman wearing my disco shirt, sitting on the original set of the Star Trek Enterprise. Uh, I, and actually, I'm not where Uhura usually sits. I'm actually where Spock was. I got it wrong last time. I'm a generational uh, Star Trek fan, and my access check-in is I have a muscle disorder, so I might pull a face at some point randomly during the conversation, never pulling a face at your Star Trek opinion. I'm pulling a face because one of my muscles is pulling me. Other than that, all my access needs are met. Amazing. Thank you so much. Maya, can I invite you to check in? Yes. Hi, I'm Maya. I go by she, her pronouns. And um, if you hear any growling or barking today, it's not me. Um, my uh, co-pilot, Chorizo, is back with me at my feet. I am a... Um, mixed mestiza guatemalan with curly hair in honor of tilly's curly hair today and all i identify as star trek light star trek femme and heavily sci-fi curious and my access needs are met otherwise so happy to be here Yay. wonderful always happy to welcome you to the table all right so you got to hear our uh special guest co-host in the opener we want to welcome back family member of our show Ms. Maya Mills Lowe aka Maya Mama uh, Maya Mama is a digital producer podcaster social justice activist and administrative maven living in Tacoma Washington she always wants us to remember to acknowledge the stolen lands of the Puyallup people welcome back Maya Mama can I have you check in yes hello I'm Maya Mama uh, my uh, pronouns are she her um, my uh, access check-in, um, I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, I am a young-looking, uh, middle-aged black woman. I'm wearing a floral dress, and I have a Star Trek Discovery little thing in the back. And, uh, um, I, and I identify as generational Star Trek fan. Uh, how about you, Dela? Thank you. Hi, I'm Dela. My pronouns are she, he, they, and Dela. Uh, I am a mixed race Filipinx uh, queer woman of color with some blue hair. I'm sitting in front of a Filipino malong, and behind me on the wall is also a Star Trek Discovery poster. Uh, I am. My access check ins are I'm good. I've discovered I've got a little bit of sniffles, so I'm going to try to manage that as we do this fun show. And I would definitely say I'm a Trekkie, Trekker, been a fan since the 90s. I identify now as a Trekhead. And um, I love all the minutia and I have some canon knowledge. So that's kind of how I enter this conversation. But I always, always, always want to learn more. So that's who we are. Friends in the chat, we invite you to tell us a little bit about yourself. How long have you been a Star Trek fan? How do you identify? Uh, these things and more are all important to us as we begin to have this conversation about this final episode of Star Trek Discovery Season 1. And before we jump into these big convos, we always like to kind of set the, the guidelines, the ground rules for us as we honor our Trek table agreements. So I just want to say welcome to all who enter. Whether you're a newbie or you're raised in a Star Trekking or generational Star Trek family, welcome. Let's build some space together. Whether you use Trek Table as your nerdy exploration or even as part of your self-care ritual, Trek Table is a weekly space to put down the world for a second and come into Trek space. A space for black, brown, indigenous women of color to be a fan, a geek, a nerd, and explore the vastness of the Star Trek multiverse. Yes, yes, Star Trek. A Trek Table is also a place for allies to come engage and explore as well. This is an opportunity for us as allies to hold space and focus on our insights, perspectives, and experiences that we may not be familiar with. 
And now that we are all here, we remind you that we seek to build an environment of mutual respect and listening in the room and in our chat. We understand that we will disagree, and that's actually part of the fun, but there's enough hate going on around in the world, so please keep your phasers on stun. Yes, so with all these things, we want to um, agree to this uh, kind of set of guidelines for this, this conversation today. So let's breathe in all those agreements together. Go ahead and take a breath in. And exhale. Thank you. Woo! Well, then this brings us to our first Trek table question posed to our Trek tables assembled here in voice and video. And those participating in twitch.tv slash outpost 13 chat. Our first question is, what's an Essek? Convince us you're right for extra points. <laughs> And that was a sampling of Holland Beck Gonzo by the band Quetzal. Our theme song today for our Trek Table questions. Trek Table question number one was, what's an Isik? So I'm asking you, I'm going to start with you, Dela. What's an Isik? Tell me what an Isik is. I believe an Isik is uh, like a penny and it is from the planet Isi. And that's why it's called an Isik. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm not sure if mm -hmm. I believe you, but you said that with confidence. You were like, there's a planet, EC. So I'm just going to say, okay, okay. Uh, Maya Mama, um, um, I'm now going to ask you, because Amanda was like, I don't know what an Isik is. Do you know more than Amanda Grayson? What's an Isik? Oh, can't say no more than Amanda Grayson. But uh, <laughs> well, it's, obvious, it's obvious that an Isik is a form of currency. Um, I believe um, that um, Amanda's uh, mother because that's where she got it from. Uh, the phrase from uh, traveled on uh, sort of the border planets that were surrounding the edges of the Federation. Um, and uh, she traveled a lot. And uh, she was on a planet where they had Isix. And um, and it's most likely it's a, it's a, a similar to value uh, to the U.S. penny. I 100% I believe that. Like you... You were like, you, you started off where I was like, well, obviously it's currency. I need more details. And then you gave so many details that I'm like, well, that has to be true because of all those details. Um, um, but um, um, let's keep going. Um, I like that Satterfield in the chat was just like, I don't know. I had to look it up. Um, Maya, what is an Isik? An Isik is actually the name of the people who um, worship the goddess Isis. Um, mm -hmm. from the Egyptian cosmology, you know, I mean, she, among many things, she's known as the goddess of the moon. So we're talking about the stars, you know, um, earth. It's a, I mean, this earth people are using this expression. So I believe it has to do with ancient times and the followers of the goddess Isis. That sounds so convincing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah. here's <laughs> I gotta say, if, if we just stop this now, we could make a lot of Star Trek fans really uh, ignorant and confused because y'all sounded so good. Um, mm -hmm. It turns out the Isik, that was actually mentioned on Deep Space Nine. There's an entire backstory um, with Quark and Isix. We could go into it. It's actually not that interesting for our purposes. Um, I'm just so pleased that you all allowed us to go to do a little headcanon fun with what's an Isik. And that brings us to the end of our Trek table question. <laughs> right, right. So we wanted to let folks know if you're not on our mailing list already, we, we, were, we were excited to put this out in the newsletter this week. Um, the Trek Table YouTube channel is up. We have posted the last two archive video shows of our last two episodes here from twitch.tv slash outpost13. Uh, we're going to drop that in the chat or we will also be pumping that um, in our socials. But if you're not on the Trek Table mailing list yet, you're going to want to join us uh, at trektablepodcast.com. But yeah, like and subscribe to us at Trek Table on YouTube. We're super excited. <laughs>
And that song, Matanzas by the band Quetzal, has been our theme intro song to the Truck Table Popcorn Recap. Uh, the game is simple. We have two minutes to try to share chunklets of plot from this week's episode. Yes, we will be talking about Star Trek Discovery Season 1, Episode 15, The War Without, The War Within, story by Akiva Goldsman and Gretchen J. Berg and Aaron Harbert, teleplay by Gretchen J. Berg and Aaron Harbert, directed by Akiva Goldsman, directed by Akiva Goldsmith. Wait a second, Akiva Goldsman or Goldsmith? Am I mixing stuff up? No, you're right. It's Goldsman. And I have to apologize. I left the title of last week's episode. This week's episode is titled, Will You Take My Hand? Thank you. So. I felt like I was saying something that was utterly inaccurate, but I was saying it with confidence, kind of like what's in Isik, and I just kept going. <laughs> yes, the way to do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a, yes, and we're so excited. I mean, yes, we care about all the things. All right, so Popcorn Recap is funny because Maya is a Trek newbie sci-fi, heavy sci-fi curious. Maya Mama and Claudia are generational Star Trek fam, and I love Minutia. So we're really trying one of our... Um, Regular viewer Satterfield is always trying to ask us to add more time, but we're really going to try for the final episode of season one. We are going to get it done. Brandon, please set two minutes on the timer. Episode 15, described in two minutes. Can we get it done? Yes. Incoming transmission. Okay, so Giorgio is running the ship. She's the captain. Burnham's not cool with that. Then Giorgio beats up Laurel to try to get information. That doesn't work. So Burnham takes her to Ash. Ash remembers uh, everything the folk did. And then he suggests that they go to the shrine on Molar that's in a Orion outpost on Kronos. Okay, totally. And then uh, Stamets does amazing jump uh, discovery into the middle of the cave. The air stabilizers keep it all okay. And then Giorgio's like, go get dressed. We gotta like go be hot so then ash tilly giorgio and burnham look all hot and low life in black leather and stuff they go to the they go to the vegas of chronos uh they play games and uh burnham starts to have ptsd from when her parents are killed and tilly does drugs oh and giorgio has sex with two orions super hot <laughs> And because Tilly is high, she realizes lots of things, like the volcanic system is active, and the drone Giorgio gave her is a hydro bomb. Burnham <laughs> confronts Cornwell with this information and says, "Like, hey, this is bad. Uh, we're gonna annihilate all life on Kronos, and, and that's not a way to win the war." But Burnham insists that Starfleet will should not uh, commit genocide and convinces Cornwell there's another way. Right, so now Burnham has to go down and like, um, 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 like first she's gonna try and convince Giorgio, and Giorgio's like, no, girl, I'm doing this for you, and she's like, no, you're not, and then they like, they they have, they almost have a fight, but then she's like, yo, if you want to actually do this, you're gonna have to murder me, and then um, everyone in the universe will chase you, and Giorgio's like, well, I don't want to murder you, I don't care if everyone in the universe is chasing me, but I don't want to murder you, so then she doesn't do it. So then Tyler tells Burnham outside the shrine that he's going to go with Laurel so that he can help both sides and they're really sad and they kiss and he gives her a rope. And then Laurel <laughs> then um, addresses the Klingon Empire and she's like, I'd like you to try. I'm going to kill you all if you don't. And then they bow down and then the war is over. Then they're in Paris and Daddy Sarek's like, you've been forgiven. Here's your badge, Burnham. <laughs> and Burnham gets a full pardon and they all get oh. medals. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Close. No, I mean, we right. won this time. I'm I'm yeah. calling it. We won. Basically. Y'all, y'all, there are like five more story beats. It's important for us to get this thing in. And let's all take one more bite at this, y'all. There, there, just, there was a few more things that took place. Come on. D okay. Don't, don't cheat us. All right. I'll finish uh, up the part. Uh, Burnham is issued a full pardon, restored rank of commander Amanda gives her a hug and Burnham and several members of the Discovery crew are presented with the Starfleet Medal of Honor including Hugh Colbert posthumously. Paul Stamets is promoted to Lieutenant Commander and Tilly is given the rank of Ensign and accepted into Starfleet Command Training Program finally. Okay, so then that leaves just the last thing, which is they're on the ship and they're like, everything's great now, let's go. And then, and then communications officer Bryce is like, wait, what's that? The USS Enterprise? And now there's drama with the USS Enterprise. It's so exciting. <laughs> and that was everything from Popcorn Recap. <laughs>
Yes, and this is amazing. Um, our screen is telling us that if you want to follow us and give us a good job, thanks to our friends in the chat. Uh, we got a lot of almost. Thanks, Satterfield got, called it an almost. So McCready nice. was like, LOL. Beard and Cola, thank you for your love. Uh, Luz Vaminda, thank you. Yes, we almost did it. We're so proud of ourselves. <laughs> I'm um, sorry. You... I believe we won. I <laughs> will not accept anything else. I, I got agree. in under the end. Uh, the buzzer wasn't even finished it it's a long <laughs> buzzer <laughs> All but right. if you've been having a great time keep the dialogue coming and we invite you to like and subscribe us on instagram at check table or on twitter at check table one and you can join convos with our all of our lovely hashtags hashtag check table hashtag b-i-w-o-c trek hashtag star trek discovery Yes, and uh, we'll drop our women in the warp nod uh, for their full uh, for their full C uh, episode rundown with details and pictures. But I I I'll, I'll agree, Maya. We won. We did it. Good job. It took us sixteen yeah. shows, but we did it. Yes. Let's jump into this next sound cue. <laughs> Hey y'all, so we are, now it's time for Discovery Designs, where we're going to dish on all of the design elements, giving us all this drama. I'm super excited. Um, this is the last season of the, of the, this is the last episode of the season, so they just spent up all of their money. So there's just so many exciting design elements. Can we talk about Quonos? It's spelled with a Q and an O and an apostrophe and an N-O-S. It's Quonos, not Kronos, and I've been spelling it wrong my entire life. Can we talk about Quonos and that hologram map and like them landing on the planet, all of that exciting stuff. Ooh, look at that map. That's a sexy looking map. I'm, I'm now for hologram maps, y'all. Last, last episode I was saying, they, they moved to the better technology of iPads, but actually I've now decided holograms are better and iPads are kind of like the equivalent of a CD versus an album. It's, it's it, it, maybe they're just cheaper to make, easier to distribute. You know, I think that the the difference is that a hologram or a holographic image is like good for like a big group, but if you're like working by yourself, you don't need like a big That's world true. map. Like you can, uh, that would probably get in the way. If you're walking <laughs> yes. down the the hallway and there's like a big planet little <laughs> grabbing it all out that's like really inconvenient um i i think that this is more of a of a betamax versus vcr uh or vhs <laughs> type of situation where the okay. betamax was actually the better product but people didn't like it they like uh vhs and so i think that that's the situation that we're dealing with on this. <laughs> oh my gosh i, I love it Yes. Can I jump in here and say I love the hologram planets because we get like the yellows and the blues and then it, they, they layered in the colors, which I appreciated. Um, I also just want to give props to Stamets because he jumped them into a cave I've never seen. I'm curious, friends in the chat, friends who are watching us um, on archivals, like any other instance of a Starfleet ship jumping directly or landing in a cave and being able to hover those uh, air stabilizers aren't just spotlights they're actually i guess balancing out the ship so that just is super sexy to me like I'll, I'll give it to stam it's like good job dude you, you found your way into like the mysterious cave i'm now realizing also i never uh because i was like stabilizer beams but then i realized we rarely see the ship land like mm -hmm. usually the ship is flying and so mm -hmm. new tech mm -hmm. And can I just, I know I'm, this is going to go to a different franchise, but the ship with the stabilizer beams that we were just showing looks a little bit like some Star Wars, like in the belly of the beast where the Millennium Falcon is. Falcon is. And, I, mm -hmm. and I don't say that as a disrespectful thing. I just, I feel like I, I like to see starships hugged by Earth. There's something interesting. I mean, yeah. <laughs> So I don't think it's disrespectful at all to compare design elements between different um, uh, uh, franchises. Um, they're all borrowing and learning from each other. So, mm -hmm. so I don't think it's disrespectful at all. But can I move us? Can I move us to the Orion yes. market? Because I actually did find something um, slightly problematic um, with the Orion uh, market. I I thought that it had an um, an Orientalist design element, 
And um, this weekend, I started uh, uh, just doing some research on it, and I realized, oh yes, this is Orientalist design. This is this is. I I just I went back to my Edward Said and started re reading like, why were these design choices made for cyberpunk, and like what were the what were the anxieties that, that were happening inside the United States in like the 1980s that created um, the necessity to create sort of um, iconography that's about fearing things that are Asian. So that, that so those are those are just a few of my concerns about the design for the for the Orion market. Am I am yeah? I taking, am I overreacting though? No, I I feel like there's a lot been written about because uh, what it it gave me uh, Blade Runner feels as well mm -hmm. right and it's i mean blade runner it was blade runner supposed to be located in like los angeles i yeah. felt like a futuristic los angeles mm -hmm. you know and it was a very kind of people of color you know i i think it was both kind of latinx asian you know it influences of those of those kind of open air markets with um you know with uh animal uh bodies of you know carcasses and <laughs> And, you know, and carving meats, you know, uh, which is delicious and wonderful and magical. <laughs> but so I, I understand why um, somebody might accidentally eat whale meat um, because it's looking good. But but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, played out in that sense. Right. Like how, how mm -hmm. could they how could they take that and um, and push at those narratives, you know, of of just being like exotic other Mm -hmm. I will say as a as an Asian person who watches this stuff, I will say as soon as I saw the cut to the planet, not the, the wide shot, but once we got a, a shot of the actual neighborhood where they were, as soon as we started to see the signage, I was like, oh, we're in like an Asian neighborhood. And I I think I've just become a little bit numb to the way in which Asian iconography is like used as evil because I was like, oh, I want to eat that. Like, what's that on the grill? Like, I just started to kind of accept the loveliness of what I was feel what I was feeling because it felt familiar. It felt like a night market. I mean, yes. even when they go to the arms dealer, it's like the arms dealer as sushi bar kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would no, just offer that. I thought. I, I mean, I don't think it's evil so much as just poor. Mm. Uh, which you know sometimes in uh, narrative stories equal the same thing. But uh, there's there's sort of a, a, a like a low class element to it um, because mm -hmm. there are Orions and you know mm. Orions yeah, I... are are bad trashy uh, criminal types. <laughs> yeah, right. The I mean, like so, like the Yangi's flea market pop up kind of places. Mm -hmm. That that mm -hmm. that also I I get that too. Mm -hmm. It um, is definitely I... very old and cliche and. I've kind of, I'm kind of yeah. over it. Yeah. What I love though is Dela, you um, named night markets, and I also when we when that episode started, I immediately had nostalgic feelings for visiting the night markets with friends in Taiwan, and I want mm. I was like, oh, I, I want to go back there. That was so much fun. And then I was like, wait a second, why am I thinking night markets and this Orion thing are the same? And then mm. this, and it is framed as this is dangerous. This is low life. They're even described mm -hmm. in the larger uh, framework of the Star Trek universe as being lower class. So mm -hmm. I think y'all just nailing it on the head. Uh, does anyone want to mm -hmm. talk about um, um, that Sang gang or like Tilly getting smoked out by Ron Howard's brother? <laughs> I uh, yes. absolutely wanted to say I there's the, the, it was the moment when when um, Tyler starts to to play and and be all tough and he that is one of the moment only moments for me where he actually is really hot to me um i know everybody else has pointed out that he's handsome and you know attractive and everything but for some reason when he gets into it and he's all playing and he's like Ugh, he's not it doesn't it doesn't feel like overly even macho it just it just looks kind of fun and sexy and um playful and i i don't know it was like a real broy kind of I don't know. Homo it's a dumb energy that he puts out when he like is like being like when he lets the Volk out just a little bit, then mm. he puts out this Dom energy and I one hundred percent agree with you. It is the only time it's like when he's did the Khmer. And it's yeah. just like you're like, ooh, oh. ooh. You know. Get your 
lady tea kettle boiling. Right. Uh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh God. I just right, want to say yes. Well, yes. No, super please. hot. Super hot. And I just want to say I love Klingon craps. Like that's how this reads to me. Um, I love that. It's almost like Klingon craps meets. Um, what's the game where like all the colors are on the dial and you have to like lay on the floor? Oh, um, I can't remember. Um, Twister. Um, what's, Twister. 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 Yes. Craps it feels... meets Twister. Oh, that's dope. I like that. Just, yes. Just because of the scope. Just because of the scope. Or maybe it's also a circa 2020 outdoor engagement tool where they try to make everything big so people will come and hang out in your space. That's what I think about. Too, or so. shuffleboard. <laughs> shuffleboard. Oh, also, my gosh. Uh, um, Tilly, I, should I... Not, Tilly should not be left alone. Alone? <laughs> she should not she's a cadet and they like left her she just walks off and eats street meat and she doesn't even know what it is and like oh God, yes. don't don't eat random street meat that's a lesson from me and, and uh, also right. after that don't smoke random um club drug come yeah. on from the strange man just because he's like he's gonna kick you out of a spot like nah dude just you leave Sleep, yeah. sis. Although I will say Cadet Tilly did pull it together. She woke up high and she saw him trying to cut the thing and she took his weapon from him and then she opened it herself. So I I'm not worried about Tilly. She knows how to handle herself <laughs> even when she's a little high, even though she was hey. all loud. Hey there, uh, mister. <laughs> yeah, I was like, um, she's revealing everything right. to the entire room. Uh, my my friends, uh, there's there's one last design element I'd like to quickly ask you about, and it's Please and it's do. um um it's Star Trek in Paris. Like I recall moments of Paris in all the different Star Trek franchises, but I don't remember going to Paris for Starfleet. Is this new? Did anyone else like? Did, did this feel just brand new to folks? Yeah. Um. Uh, Go ahead, my Tom mama. Paris. <laughs> uh, spent uh, he spent time in in Paris when he was a cadet. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, remember, because he went to that bar, right? Uh, yes. Sabine or something like that. Uh, so that I mean, that's the only real memory. Also, there's an episode. There's some stuff in Voyager about um, about yeah. Paris where there's right, some interactions. You. There's some things where, and I don't know if it's spoiler to talk about Harry Kim going there or whatever. But yes. Uh, I know that, so there is a little bit of, uh, I, I do think it's weird though that, um, like why aren't they, the, why, why Picard aren't they never Francisco? goes there. I never heard of Picard oh. going there. That's like next door, man. Yeah. Isn't no, Picard supposed to be French? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is. He has a opinion. <laughs> Jean-Luc. Jean-Luc. Oh, well, that was incredibly useful. Maya, Mama, thank you so much for giving me a little more clarity because that Voyager connection totally helps me to tie together some of those design elements. And that is our time. And I can't wait to recap the entire season with y'all and think about all of those awesome design elements. Yes, yes. And uh, we, before we transition to the next sequence, we just want to say, if you are not already following us on Facebook.com, find us at the Trek Table Podcast. We'd love to share some things. We're actually going to drop some fun content uh, while we're on break there. So don't forget to follow us there. Uh, and as we head into our next musical break, Trek Table question number two. What is more important, survival or principles? Mira que regresa el maldito Viene con las manos llenitas y De piedra que no quiere arrojar Hello everyone, so we are here with Trek Table question number two which is what is more important, survival or principles? Um, I'm going to turn to Maya Mama first and just ask you, um, what's more important? Well, I mean, nobody wants to die, but principles. Principles are more important. Oh, Burnham is right. If you lose that, then what are you even fighting for? What's what's the point? Um, hmm. If you become if you become the enemy, um, then why why did you even fight? Why didn't you just let him win? That's uh, that's my opinion. Interesting, interesting. I'm, I'm. It's interesting because I'm just thinking about battle versus war, 
-hmm. And in that paradigm, it's, oh, are you making a choice to win a battle so that you don't lose the war? And is that the mm -hmm. difference between, or is that what survival means? I don't know. Dela, what do you think? I appreciate that frame because I think that's what I've been struggling with. As I, if I think about how I live my life, I live my life certainly deeply uh, by principles, and I and I and I've made life choices almost to the point of like I would die for my principles, right? But then I think about there are certain moments where I was like, yeah, but where are we in the scheme of the battle or the war? And I would hope that I would stay in principle land, but I could see making a choice at a, at a critical time and saying I'm going to survive in order for these. But at the moment we were in the show, I, I agree with Burnham. So mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I feel like, can I be flip floppy? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. It's it's not like Burnham um, at the end of the episode, she talks to Sarek and Sarek is like, I almost did a genocide. And she doesn't go shame on you in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, Maya, what do you think? Um, what's more important, principle or survival? I, you know, I think it's really important the moment that she's not, that she is standing up, but that her whole team is behind her at this point. Because at the beginning of the season, she's making this individual kind of choice. So I guess I, what I'm really trying to say is, is, yes, I think you need to stand up for your principles, but I think it's the best when you are working as a team or working as a community and you've you've come to that place together um and 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 you know but it, it's just really hard because i think as a younger person i was all principles and as i'm going you know in these next couple of years it's i mean right now i feel like a lot of it has been survival right so and and what kind of survival are we are we really engaging in what kind of life are we really living when we have a moment to even think about it so i don't know it it's it's not black or white for me i'm a, a libra uh moon so what do you expect <laughs> i'm um i'm i you know in the middle of us having this conversation i had the um um the idea about battle versus war um, Satterfield um, uh, shares in the chat, survival is a big question. I can choose to die for my principles, but I'm willing to let those go for the survival of those I love. Those choices are mm. easy. In the moment, my principles, yes. my kids come first, right? So, yes. um, and, 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 and um, from Mrs. Seal, uh, if I'm the last one um, of my species or family, I pick survival to carry on, um, to carry on our principles. So I, 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 I'm returning to the, oh, I think sometimes it's about going, oh, if I if I win this battle in this way, am I actually doing a move that makes me lose the entire war? Because I, I feel like that's what Burnham was, that was the argument Burnham was making. She was like, hey, Katrina, if you win like this, you lose everything. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh -huh. Y'all, I love uh -huh. having Star Trek conversations with you. You're the best, you in the chat and you here at the table. That was amazing. And that was Trek table question number two. Yes, yes. And ooh, 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 it is almost at announcement time for us. And look, I'm going to tell you this. Our special guest, here's some clues, woman of color from Star Trek Picard. But you're going to have to stay tuned until after Space Runway. And now is that time in our ritual where we invite everyone to move around in your seats and screens because it's now time for our Trek Table Dance Break with Space Runway! And here we go for some eye-catching looks from Function of Fashion in the 23rd century. Space, Space, Space Runway, welcome to Space Runway. This week we are doing highlights from season one, episode 15, and there are 10 looks today. So excited about that, there was so much. Here we go. Look number 10, sad boy blue onesie. Here's Tyler, still in recovery, but trying to help Starfleet map that Quonos. This full body zippered onesie looks super comfy, but a little awkward as our former head of security is now stripped of rank and focused on the security of one. 
is it all about the individual aura? Because we do not remember Burnham looking this sad in her onesie. <laughs> I think so. Look number nine. Hot low lifes on a cool walk. The terrible Terran is in charge of the away mission, and you know what that means. Away mission outfits. Giorgio Woo! tells everyone to dress like low lifes, so we get one of our fave hallway <laughs> runways where everyone emerges in leather and black, including Giorgio serving face, face, face. Stick straight hair, her bangs in a pomp, adjusting her fingerless gloves, and a fierce capelet with shoulder pads, metal studs, and a black furry train. Look number eight. What's in the bag, baddie? Thank goodness Tyler is invited onto this mission just so he can change out of his sad blue onesie <laughs> so he can carry that big black bag with his arms to trade. Oh, the arms are in the bag to trade. All nonchalant on, on Tyler's broad man shoulders. He's now all sleek and ready to play Klingon reindeer games while looking extra tall in a black leather jacket, <laughs> black pants, and low slung belt. He's got the goods to trade and can walk a hallway. Any room for a stowaway on this mission? Because Tyler is looking so good at looking so bad. <laughs> yes, arms to trade. Come to my gun show. Look number seven. Beware the Cormac Andrew on the grill. Tilly is invited by George Roo to uh, on the away mission because the former Terran Emperor thinks there is a there is a Captain Killy under all those curls. Tilly emerges with straight red hair with a single braid, a long leather vest, leather pants, some peekaboo cleavage, and whatever is really in that case locked on her wrist, like an explosively cute charm bracelet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look number six. Burnham's got that scoop, oopie doop, shoopy doop, scoop neck and scarf. Burnham's look for the Orion outpost includes a functional scoop neck top, leather jacket with folds, silver studs, and a green knitted mini infinity scarf around her neck. This badass look works for day trips to Kronos in Orion clubs, Klingon crap games, and of course, traipsing around the ancient Klingon shrines. This look even adds just the right amount of earthiness because she's beamed back to Discovery to challenge Admiral Katrina Cornwell and ask if there needs to be a mutiny up in here, up in here. That's right. Look number five. You light up my tattoo. <laughs> Tyler finishes winning at Sing and comes to find Burnham contemplating beautiful parchment samples of the hottest Orion Outpost tattoos. We love that you get an almost invisible tattoo that lights up when you touch it. Truly touching as Tyler presses Burnham about why she fled the game and how she's doing here on Kronos. Who knew that Klingons give tattoos by candlelight? Very romantic. Who knew? And look number four, sex and circuses. Captain Mother shows the way once again as she lounges in this sexy black leather bustier with the plain silk bikini bottom, luxurious laid out amongst the golden sheets and the beautiful green of her Orion sex workers intertwined around her legs and arms and back. We see you, Captain Mama Giorgio. Sex positivity, because even up in here, she decides she needs to top this guy in the silver speedo, gun in hand to get what she really wants. That location of the Shrine of Molor. <laughs> yeah. Look number three, Laurel, coming out of the dark. <laughs> Laurel is out of the shadows and out of the brig as Burnham gives Laurel the gift of Klingon domination. Done with her prison blues and silvers, Laurel is back in her silvery white armor with red jewel tips. We even see later that Laurel commands the 24 houses to bend to her will. She is lit up with shades of red to fulfill her destiny and not just become another torchbearer, but the flame itself. Yeah. And look number two, mole medals, mole medals, and mole medals. 
Admiral Cornwell appears with the geometry of metals on both her right and left chest as Michael speechifies in the final minutes of the episode. Cornwell and the others, remaining Starfleet admirals, are all on the dais as the Disco Bridge crew gets a medal. You get a medal and you get a medal! And R.I.P. to Dr. Hugh. Luckily, Starfleet won't do you like uh, Star Wars did to Chewie. And even mm. Daddy Stamets of uh, Boo gets a posthumous medal. Aww. That's right. And finally, look number one. The ambassador's wife, gowns and glamour. Mama Amanda Grayson shows up in not one, but two fabulous outfits in Paris. Not only to offer Michael another isic for her thoughts, but to ponder what it all means. Amanda's blue gown with a cape and clear umbrella is a perfect look in the rain. We get a glimpse of more Mama Ambassador fashion cheering from the audience as Amanda rocks a burgundy mauve colored dress with little peekaboo caplet sleeves. Compliment by elbow length black gloves and her hair swept up dazzling with a netting of jewels hugging those buns is it us or is amanda overdressed at all times mm-hmm. we don't have time to talk about her husband Sarek, but he looks nice too and that's it for <laughs> space runway this week fashion form function in the future And now it's time for our very special announcement. As we all know, Trek Table is finishing season one of Disco and getting ready to make our trip across the mycelial network. That's right. Our friends at Outside In Theater have been planning an exciting move. And here to tell us about it is Tamlet Tamita, a.k.a. Commodore O of Picard. Hey everyone at Outpost 13 on Twitch. We're coming at you, inviting you all to join us at Outside In Theater on YouTube, June 13th. And we really hope to see you all there. Yes, yes, letting us live long and prospering. Thank you so much to the amazing Tamlin Samita for that drop. Uh, We're so excited, yes. Trek Table is going to be moving to the Outside In YouTube page. Uh, So is all of Outpost 13, and we're the first to drop this, so we're so excited. Thank you so much to everybody here at Outpost 13 and all of our followers here on Twitch. We're super excited um, to do this move. So June 13th is that date. Uh, Make sure to follow us and subscribe to us so we can keep sharing more information and more details. Instagram, uh, at Trek Table or sign up for our mailing list at trektablepodcast.com so you can get all the behind the scenes info and tea because some super special people are coming with us in season two. All right, so we've got all the business. I was all excited. All right, so we're in this final uh, back. So yeah, everybody just come to take a second. I know like lots of us are super excited. Like, whew, yeah, that was, you know, I, I admire that Tamlin Commodore O can do the Vulcan. I can't, I'm working on it. Um, it's been a topic in after chat. So yes, we are so excited as we wrap up this uh, season one of Star Trek Discovery, as we think about this whole um, episode 15, Will You Take My Hand? Uh, I've been thinking about how like Burnham's been on this journey, right? From the very beginning, we've seen Burnham have to make some choices about who she wants to be. And we've been having these conversations about principles or survival. So I just want to give us a chance to weave it all together. Um, and then Burnham kind of falling in love with the Klingon and, uh, you know, Sarek telling us like, oh, that's the irony of all ironies, because this is the episode where we do finally hear Burnham tell us her story about how she has become the person she has become. So I find it really powerful and um, amazing. And so one of my questions is just like, yeah, can love mend all wars? And as I think about what's happening in our own earth world right now in 2021, I don't know. I I hope that love can heal, but I see so much. So topic number one for us in thematics is we want to talk a little bit about Burnham and Tyler. Last week, we kind of talked about, are we on an accountability journey? Are we on a restorative justice journey? But now as we kind of pull back, we see um, 
Tyler kind of showing up, trying to be there as Burnham is moving through uh, Kronos. And I just wonder if, if folks have any other parting thoughts about Burnham and Tyler and kind of where we land um, with Burnham and, and, and Tyler. So uh, Maya Mama, I'm wondering, can you start us off? Oh, well, I think that Burnham is, is finally like really settling and learning who she is um, and, and, and what her principles are. Um, and, and, and her ability to, to empathize is, um, is a really big deal. It's, it's one of the reasons why Kronos is even there. Um, and, and, and Tyler, I think, is on a, a parallel journey as well. Um, but he's just, like, a little bit behind. And um, I think that's why she's understanding of his need to go away, like, to learn and stuff. Uh, this is Claudia. I feel like I've got such complicated, mixed feelings about this particular character, but I've been thinking more about what's the story of um, restorative justice and how do we uh, build a future with those who have harmed us in the past? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I do see, it does feel like Berna, uh, that it does feel like Tyler is trying to take accountability um, and um, and seems to be moving in responsible ways, which is why I don't feel creeped out when I see Burnham giving moments of forgiveness. I will say that it all feels really fast because it's in the last couple of episodes. I wish there'd been like maybe one more episode to give me as a viewer just a little more time to process. Burnham processes so fast. It's amazing. She really does. She's like an emotional supercomputer. Like... <laughs> You know, like just the speed. Um, Maya, our thoughts here about Burnham and Tyler and kind of where we land at the end of this se this season? Um, yeah, so I also was very, um, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, now that it's all out in the open, I feel like it's something that can actually be handled. You know, Burnham puts it all up in his face. You know, uh, before that, definitely he served as a character to kind of, be a, min a mirror to her as well uh, about you know her sort of fears her needing to try to try new things but you know she she pushes back on that when he calls her out about running away because she's I don't think she's not running away right she's she's dealing with some real stuff that is really that's been there under the surface we've all kind of known it or that about the whole issue with Klingons and um, yeah I think but I think they're the one thing that ties them is their kind of multi um, ethnic or like, you know, intercultural kind of experiences. And that is something that that they share and it allows them to still be friends or at least still be reflecting back in each other. And I think it's I think it's great that he's like, cool, you said to back off and and deal with my my stuff, learn, you know, relearn to tie knots. I'm going to go. And I think that that is a beautiful thing, you know, like mm -hmm. stepping back. Uh, sometimes, you know, I really think it's important to to show up and continue to show up and then and then being wise enough to be like, OK, I need to step back mm -hmm. so that we can mm -hmm. at least remain friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, like very mature. Thank you for giving us that mature spin on like how Burnham and Tyler evolved because you while you were sharing that, you also helped me kind of realize like the other mature turn for Burnham in this moment. And Claudia, you kind of brought it, you brought it up previously was Sarek kind of showing up to her and saying, you know, you've been forgiven. Here's your Starfleet badge back. And oh yeah, I almost, I almost commit like the way he's kind of like self-congratulatory. Like I almost wanted to commit genocide, but you child, you did not. So just watching the shift in not just Burnham and Tyler, but kind of the world of people around her. I mean, obviously in Runway, we talked about how Amanda can show up in two amazing outfits. Um, I feel like I'm just missing her holding um, a copy of Alice in Wonderland. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I want to make Amanda a purse with that book because it is so their connector and just loving these moments where we see, yeah, I just appreciate we got a couple of these closure moments with Burnham as much as we also got an opening up of like what really happened to Burnham uh, as a child on Doctari Alfie and uh, Doctari Alpha. And we'll talk about that in spoiler zone. Um, 
Also, you know, Tilly as her girl shows up. I feel like we finally got the roomie convo. And I just want to open it up. You know, we get Tilly kind of cock blocking um, Tyler in the hallway as she kind of crosses and tries to get in between all that. And wh while they're in the hallway, they don't actually say anything. T Tilly and Burnham just exchange a look. But then we get that fun, you know, Gormagander space whale side convo about, are you OK? I'm here for you. Um, other thoughts about uh, Tilly as we as we transition into this combo. Um, I loved that because it wasn't subtle, like at <laughs> all. Like, like she just like was like, "I'm gonna stand here now." He didn't have a choice; he had to leave. Um, uh, I appreciated the uh, the empathy and the support that she was offering um, at Burnham, and and the way that Burnham was like, "Thank you." Uh, cause she really needed that. Uh, also, I just want to state that it is really hard to be friends with a couple when that couple breaks up. And I get that. And so a lot of what Tilly is doing is, is, you know, she's friends with both of them. She wants them both to be okay. And, mm. it, it, and it's hard. That's hard stuff. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, uh, it was good to see her like step up as a friend. Also don't eat street meat. The mysterious street meat. I, you know, I don't agree. When I went to Korea, I ate well, and I have no idea what I ate, and it was all delicious. I trusted the. I trusted my friend who was like, "This, this seems like a good vendor." Oh well, that's okay <laughs> not, if your friend I'm says it's okay. Well, no, I'm just saying, like, you know, she has she has moral issues against the whale meat. It's not that it's bad whale meat. I'm sure it's quite healthy. Okay. Um, um, coming back to the question that you asked. Um, yeah, just Tilly, know what it is, right? <laughs> yeah. Tilly um, seems like um, the best partner ever. Like, like in any mm. universe. Like, it seems mm. like if you need like a, a like a like a person to have your back. If I'm a, if I'm a bad guy in the bad universe, I want Captain Killy to be my girl. In this universe, mm. I want Tilly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I wanna I wanna expand this kind of conversation that we're having about Tilly because I, I, and I realized I called her Ensign Tilly early in in our newsletter this week in a way that I was like, oh maybe she wasn't quite Ensign yet; she was still Cadet, and we've seen such a growth from her, and I think this whole season we've seen a lot. So I wanna I wanna pull back even further from Tilly and Burnham and Tyler and just think about this conversation we've been faced with this whole season about what is the relationship between Starfleet and the Klingons. Uh, we, we've talked before in previous Trek Table episodes about colonialist ethics and where do we feel like we land with that. So I, I kind of want to transition us into this conversation about colonialism and Klingons. I can't help but, you know, originally I was just like, we don't see a lot of Klingons where we are. Oh, because we're in the Orion outpost, but we're still on Kronos. Um, and I just wonder, like, is this so? Yes, Burnham interrupts the genocide, and we give the detonator to Laurel, and we get um, this moment where Laurel gets to take charge of the Klingons. Is this a good non-colonialist win for Starfleet? Is this just Starfleet putting their own puppet dictator in power? Oh, which is the new spin? Which I was like. <sighs> Is Laurel just like a Ferdinand Marcos in waiting? I don't know. That's a Filipino reference. Um, yeah. So that's my question to the table right now. Claudia, thoughts on colonialism and you and, just blew um, my entire mind. I am now having all of these thoughts about um, um, Laurel as a, as an imposed dictator. Oh, that's deep. That's complicated. These are some of my thoughts. Some of my thoughts are about how the Klingons. In the story, they're framed as they're just destructive. Like they're just they're just killing folks and destroying. And when they and and when they're and in other um, Star Treks that I've watched, it's like oh the Klingons are always the bad guys. So like when a Klingon goes to your planet, they're framed as being the heavy as the bad guy. But the Starfleet is framed as the good guy. So if they go to your planet, you needed help. It's good that they came. You weren't doing anything good with that planet anyway. How happy? How good? So I'm just really, I'm, I'm curious about colonialism and imperialism and the assumptions that are kind of embedded in the storytelling and, and the kind of um, a, a scary thought that I had last night as I was meditating on this was this. Starfleet is coded as good 
because it colonizes planets where nobody's on them. And that's how you have a healthy post-colonial society. There's just no one else out there. Um, I'm, I, it's, it's a kind of a cold-hearted, uh, dark t- uh, observation. Yes, Maya, Mama. Well, you know, yeah, that is the only way to, like, I guess, morally colonize is to go to a planet where there's nobody. Um, now, the, 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 um, help me out, wording is escaping my brain, the prime directive, the prime directive of Starfleet, of the Federation, is to not interfere with existing cultures, um, Mm -hmm. which is, um, I think, anti, uh, uh, um, anti, uh, um, and so... I think that, in theory, the Federation, um, they are not uh, colonists, in theory. But in Mm -hmm. practice, um, they think that they're right, and that their way is good. Um, And it's also very Mm -hmm. human-centered. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I want to, I, so let's, let's connect that human centeredness, this idea of colonialism and yeah, I'll just say I made that connection. So I'm excited for us to go when we come back on June 13th, we're going to do a season one recap. So we'll also have a chance to kind of dig deep. And so I'm going to invite friends in the chat, friends who are listening to us on the YouTube archive or on the audio podcast archive. If you want to send us thoughts, uh, you can always send us thoughts uh, on our socials for things that you want us to talk about in the season one recap. I think I want to I want to build on this colonialist idea and I want to expand it because when I saw at the very very end of the episode while Michael is doing her amazing I will just say I fell in love with Michael Burnham giving all the Starfleet speeches like yes 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 I love her logs I love her insights I I, I find her her journey super compelling and her using of logic as a way to deal with the trauma of losing her parents um, all of those pieces I find super compelling. And then we get to this moment on the dais where everybody's getting awards and I'm seeing, and they're naming the Vulcans, the Tellurides, the Andorians, um, and all the folks. And I'm like, and the Vulcans, but there's still a lot of humans nearby. And so I'm just wondering, are we seeing it, Starfleet? We just celebrated in real t- here in, in our, in our lives, uh, in 2020, April, um, first contact day right and i just think about that in the context of things how in the star trek story when humans first get contact it's a good thing but that's not always the case for other peoples who are encountered by folks who are exploring and building so i just want to talk about this dominance of human culture we're going to get into spoiler zone in just a sec but um i want to offer claudia do you have thoughts i know you were you were sharing some insights with us about how we think about the way in which tilly as killy is is coded with her straight hair curly hair that feels like a human dominant kind of idea as well so i want to transition there as well oh well well i I, I, it's funny because i'm always watching this show through two lenses i'm watching it as as if star trek is real and pretending that everything in the story is totally real, because I'm also recognizing what's happening um, in politically in the world, what what impacts some of the showrunner, like like why they're making the storytelling choices that they're making. Mm-hmm. So in universe, I'm going to respond and say I actually think I'm going to agree with Maya and say or Ma- Ma- Maya Mama and say that um, the act of Starfleet giving all of the power and choice to this female leader in Laurel, that's actually mm-hmm. an anti-colonialist move. Because while they're like, oh, we have a choice. We can either destroy you all or give this one cling on all the power and hope you work it out. Um, so so I feel like that's an anti-colonialist move in terms of like, they're not they're not in, in as much control as they could be, but mm-hmm. they're, they're involved and we'll get into that in the spoiler zone. Um, and then in terms of the outside universe, like just the world we live in, um, curly hair is seen as a black thing. So it's seen as being lower class. Like straight hair is seen as, as classy because of white supremacy and white domination. So it's interesting that in the future, they wrote a future where an Asian woman, she's from mm-hmm. the Terran universe though. So maybe that's like some Terran racist politics coming in, but she's, she's indicating curly hair, bad, straight hair, good. And that's that's pure colonialist um, um, from from the real life. That's that's mm-hmm. colonialism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, 
couple of, I know that we're in like a super deep topic moment, so I don't want to be like, any last thoughts while I, before we jump into spoilers? <laughs> uh, it's always bothered me in Star Trek that, uh, that everything is, uh, human centered, uh, mm -hmm. because if you notice, uh, everything is human or non-human and the way that they, they, they describe others is, is, is all based on the baseline normalness of humanity, um, mm. of Terran humanity. I don't mean evil Terran empire. I mean, earth. Um, um, it, but most of that has to do with the fact that Starfleet is an earth organization. It is based on mm. earth. It is earth. The Federation is different. Like Starfleet and the Federation work together, but technically they're different uh, organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you have members of the Federation that join Starfleet, but Starfleet itself is an or is an Earth-based organization, and that is why there are more humans than non-humans. Mm. Um, you know, and that the diversity does grow. You know, like you see um, the first Kelpian. Uh, mm -hmm. You will see. Um, people of other races and cybernetic folks and things like that um, cy cy cybernetic augmentations but um, it does sort of bug me even, even though <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I can understand that logic but it always bothered me that it's always uh, human or not human that really helps me though Maya Mama thank you Totally. Yeah, I just want to, I just have a quick idea, and I also, as I have another set, sentient being in my arms here, <laughs> Chardiso <laughs> has been snoring in the background, um, but he's now in my arms, <laughs> so um, if you hear him, um, he, he has feelings too. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, in terms of just creating the, the show and what I've, you know, understood about Star Trek as a universe, it's, it, I, it is about us as humans uh, creating a different, a kind of mirror, you know, and how science fiction reflects who we are as humans, right? Because we are running around here um, fighting uh, and, and thinking about all our differences as the ethnicities, cultures, and ways of being. And so the alien other is, is another type of mirror you know, so I, I think that ha that probably has something to do with the with the human centeredness about it. Um, but the alien other is is something that comes up in literature and narratives all the time. And sometimes it's just evil, bad. And and I think more complex readings are are ways of, of showing our own humanness our, and our own, um, you know, wh what do we really want to be like and how do we really uh, you know, reflect on d different ways. So I, 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 I just really appreciated this conversation because it is, it is sort of pushing at that of, of like, oh, even, even in this realm where we're trying to think about different cultures, different ways of being, we're still uh, can center our own cultures, still be, mm -hmm. um, yeah, ethnocentric, you know, or mm -hmm. human centric. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not a full on thought, but, but it. I do think it has to do with, um, you know, the ideas of, of narrative storytelling and how, how yeah. we can easily jump into a, to a show and, and figure out who we identify with. And I think that's also the queering of this show or the, mm. the gender politics of this show is the way that, um, you know, some of us identify with the aliens. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just say, I mean, the very beginning of this, the series is all in Klingon. I love it. I love that we're getting previously on Discovery in actual Klingon. We're hearing it. So I think they are trying. But yeah, we're still seeing some of these limitations and these challenges. Uh, and it just, yeah, super chunky. It's super excited. And there's always going to be more. I'm going to say join us on June 13th for our season one recap. We're going to jump into these thematic things as well. But now it's time for us to go into that part of the show because spoilers, uh, thematics wouldn't be complete if we didn't do spoiler zone. And if you're watching us in synchronous order, then you're going to want to turn down your volume or mute your audio. If you're watching us, we'll wave back. You'll see the, the red spoiler zone go to green. Um, we also invite you to do a free flow doodle like Maya and Marie Ren do when we're doing this. 
And today's special, Maya's going to join us in the spoiler zone. So without further ado, Brandon, can you take us to the spoiler zone in three, two, one. Incoming transmission. Amazing. So welcome to Spoiler Zone. Uh, Maya C got so excited after the end of this episode and you watched ahead. Uh, <laughs> welcome to season two insights. Uh, do you know how far you've got to? Yeah, go ahead. What do you want I, to share with us? I don't. I I just know there's Spock is coming. Uh, I know all the, you know, I I feel like I was so good at holding back, going, see, you know, episode by episode, week by week in almost a Zen manner. And then when we finally got to the end i was like oh no i'm going i'm going forward i just i want to watch a bunch of episodes all together and so um i did that i don't feel bad about it i feel a little bit bad about it because i'm confessing <laughs> um but yeah i mean there's just so much hair in the in the season two there's a new captain you know who's bringing back that kind of old school feel of uh, Star Trek. Uh, I'm at the point where it's still just like, where is Spock? I don't know if that's going to be the whole thing uh, in season two. There's, uh, And why is everything always Burnham's fault? Or at least she takes it on as being her fault. Like, oh, well, Spock's off in the in the world and we haven't talked because I was mean to him as a kid because I was trying to protect him from this red angel or, or whatever that is yet. So I don't know what that is yet. That's where I'm at. I just know that they, they got to... Uh, a planet that um, uh, generations of Earth people mm -hmm. uh, have colonized, and so there was no one else on that planet. Um, so when we were talking about that, um, I was I was remembering that portion, and they were they were all like, "Oh, we can't reveal that we're from the future or that we have spaceships." So that's that's where I got to, and I was like, "Ooh, I'm so glad to be in a new season, and I can't wait for." for um yeah june 13th and, and the rest of june um for us going forward amazing all right i'm gonna say um i want to say thank you for joining us and invite you to doodle while we go there she goes all right so maya chichia is gone maya mama claudia three of us we have four Ooh. minutes and 46 seconds in this spoiler zone so much so much Oh, wow. So, so, so much. I, I do have to say, um, I, after our conversation about all the colonization and, and whatnot, it's really nice to know that the Federation is, or that Starfleet actually does move off Earth and does actually become more uh, Federation-centered uh, or and a part of the Federation than it previously, uh, like, is in this, in this timeline. Um, and uh, it's always Burnham's fault because she's the lead and also because <laughs> she can't she can't help it mm -hmm. spock makes a comment about how like why is it everything always on you you don't have to do this um mm -hmm. also i am really looking forward to spock this is my second favorite spock uh that, i like him he's different he's he's, he's like not him. leonard the moy he's not leonard the moy mm -hmm. i need him to be leonard the moy just basically he's not leonard and so i'm confused by him always all the time always he's uh gregory peck's grandson okay okay um <laughs> I don't know if i'm that really means anything, but um i'm i'm excited um um for pike strangely mm. enough I, I i had issues with spock i loved pike i thought but favorite Pike's pike. casting was awesome he's my mm. favorite pike he's the best pike he is he's, mm -hmm. he's my mm -hmm. pike forever um, mm. Also, um, number one, she's so good. She's so good. I'm like actually excited about their show because like this was be like a spinoff show yes. with mm -hmm. Pike and number one and all of that, which is a gigantic spoiler because now you know he makes it through season two, um, and they have a spinoff. I, and I love Rebecca Romaine. Rebecca yes. Romaine is so good and she's so she awesome. And she I gotta is. say the 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 little short track with yes. her oh and my Spock gosh. Yes. and the turbo Loved lift. It. Yes. Oh. Okay, so can good, I so ask good. the spoiler question about that? Do we think yeah. that they wanted to kiss each other at the end of that episode? Is that what that was? Was no, that no, sapiosexual no. love or no, desire? That was, that was explaining, um, that was actually doing a bunch of labor to explain why Spock 
acts super emotional and wild in the original pilot episode and then oh. acts all different. So like that was them doing some deep canon work for nerds like me who oh, know nice. that the Star Trek, like that the Spock character was actually not designed to be emotionlessly or to be emotionless until they did the reboot with Captain Kirk. So it's, can I say well, my favorite part? He had to part? do the work. He did. He did. Yeah. And I will just uh, lovingly uh, be in the Star Trek fight. I do like Ethan Peck as Spock. So, Claudia, I love that we're going to get to disagree about this all next season. <laughs> um, and I will just say my fa I, season two is my favorite. I can't wait for us to see uh, Jet Reno show up. I can't wait for Daddy Colbert to come back. And I cannot, cannot, cannot wait for Mama Burnham to show up. Like, I am so ready for us to have this moment to meet mama burnham so that we understand we get to get to this moment where burnham also understands she doesn't have to be the responsibility hoarder it's actually not her fault that actually in our lives we understand stories based on the information we know not always necessarily the full scope of the real story so yeah so i'm just super yeah i i get why burnham is a responsibility hoarder because people also push it on her and she has to step up into it at times so yeah those are some you know, of my. Uh, so when Go. when she's telling her story to um, mm -hmm. to Tyler, yes, thank you. She says she heard her mother slowly being killed, but that's not true. That's not what she witnessed, but that's what she thinks she witnessed. Which uh, it doesn't matter actually what the truth is because trauma is trauma is trauma. But right. um, I do think that that's really interesting, and I'm actually looking forward to rewatching to see exactly I, what it was yeah. that happened and my head canon is she hears them trying to get into the room where her mother has locked herself because she's doing the space jumps but i you i also have a head canon question of like so when little michael how does little michael get rescued does she actually emerge into the room where her parents are dead is that how come she thinks her mom is dead too has she actually held her dead mo like all these like head canon questions yeah yeah so it's, it's, last 15 it's, seconds of this spoiler um, zone go um, I did a huge amount of uh, research and reading on the Klingons, and we do not have time to go into all of that in this episode, but season two, we are going to be discussing some Klingon history, baby. Time crystals. Ah! Yeah! Yes! I just, that. I just wanted to say that at the end. <laughs> Welcome the Rolls, baby. Transfer of data is complete. All right, so we're back. <laughs> Maya's looking down. We're waving. <laughs> She's drawing. Um, She's drawing. She is. So, right. Um, so we want to welcome everybody back uh, for the spoiler zone. Uh, we have finished this spoiler zone. And um, we're going to keep waving in the visuals so that Maya can look up and see us. Um, if you're having a great time with us, we just invite you to make sure you're following us. We would love to hear your spoiler thoughts. Feel free to DM us at uh, Instagram, at TrekTable, or on Twitter, um, at TrekTable1. Uh, we're so excited. And here she's looking up. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, almost. No, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have all the technology in the world. Oh, here she is. And now she's back. <laughs> Super excited. All right, Maya. Welcome back. Quickly at the end of this spoiler zone, uh, will you share a doodle with us? What did you, were you able to get done? Um, yeah, I'm going to keep working on it. But um, this is Giorgio in her um, Orion kind of outfit. With, I was trying, I wanted to get to the capelet, but I was focusing too hard on her eyebrows. You can't mm -hmm. see it. There, Ooh. oh. Oh, no, I no, see those strong can... eyes. That's yeah. nice. That's nice. Oh, those, oh that's right some there. Giorgio makeup. Yeah. So, so for friends a listening. Giorgio makeup tutorial. Yeah, I wanted to make Giorgio sure. Eyes. I was also trying to get in, get into the pompadour. I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I, this, this whole doodling exercise is making me realize, like, oh yeah, I used to draw and kind of doodle and copy, um, uh, so much, uh, uh, years and years that I haven't done something like this, and now I'm like, oh, I have to get it right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, you did a beautiful job. There there are no wrong answers. That's what I love about Trek Table is we want to help build everybody's Star Trek knowledge and even prepare for our season two deep dive into Klingon history that Claudia just dropped in Spoiler Zone. So I'm excited Ooh. to repeat it. Yeah, we're about to do it. 
Um, and maybe some opportunities to talk to some Klingons from the show. We'll figure that out, too, for season two Ooh. as well. All right. So we want to say thanks, everybody, for, for being in this. I know Claudia's super excited now. Uh, let's Thanks for being in this with us, Let's uh, for being in thematics and for the super fun spoiler zone. And those are our thoughts on thematics, uh, Star Trek Discovery Season 1, Episode 15, Will You Take My Hand? Uh, and with that, we just want to remind you, if you're having a great time and you want to support women of color exploring Star Trek, uh, please follow us at patreon.com slash trek table. We would love to welcome you as a patron. Yes, and as we head into our final Trek table, question number three, what do you think, why do you think Ash went with Laurel? <laughs> Trek table question of our show and of the season. And y'all, this was the question that was really burning in my mind. Why does Ash just go, hey, burn him? You know what I decided to do? I'm going to Kronos. I'm going to stay here on Kronos. Peace. Why? Uh, Maya Mama, what, what, do, what, do you, what do you think some of the reasons are? Well, he's on that path of discovery. Um, he is essentially two people. He needs to find a way to combine those two people. Um, but also, he, I think he wants to help. Uh, he, uh, I think he, he feels he needs to atone for uh, some of Voke's actions. Uh, and, uh, but I didn't think of it as going with Laurel. I don't think he chose Laurel. I think he's still choosing Starfleet. Um, and, uh, like, he's there to, to support the peace in, uh, on Kronos. But, mm. uh... But I think he's still a Starfleet man. I don't think he cho I I don't think he goes with Laurel, even though that's those are his words. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Maya, Maya, what what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think again he wants to. He's used to being useful. He wants to be useful. He's he's explored a lot of coming back to humanness, and he wants to go, you know be useful in a Klingon, you know, understanding way. And also, I think he wants to explore new haircuts. I'm just going to leave that right there. That's it. New hairstyles. So, we'll so potentially shoulder. this is, he's in it for the Klingon fashions. Um, Taylor, um, um, what's, what's your take on um, Ash's choice to stay on the planet Kronos? I mean, I would definitely agree that I think he wants to not live in a petri dish as a star as a former starfleet officer who we now understand the complexity of his biology um part of me i guess wants to hope that he also romantically wants to give burnham her space and give her a time to and i think ash wants to go out in the world and figure out who he is and he's tried to be around starfleet i think Giorgio did a super like she was just mean you know what's up half breed like you're so broken like you know when she first meets him so I think Ash is trying to do some self-building. I think he's listening to Burnham's advice and he has to build up who he is and figure that he has some unresolvedness with the Volk inside. So he mm. needs to deal with the Volk inside and he needs to go attend to that business. And then maybe we'll see, maybe, you know, space is big. You know, you hope mm. that people come back around, but you never know. Mm -hmm. You know, I enter these conversations with strongly held opinions and then y'all turn me around. Um, um, I've now completely changed my mind. I initially thought that this was like, oh, he's he's running away from responsibility or conflict, but no, this is the responsible move. He's running, he's giving, he's giving Michael space as she requested. So it's, it's actually, that's the solid move. And he's not making her ask for it more and again. He's recognizing that if he's on that trip, they're gonna have to work together. Um, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's a good thing that Tilly was there to help um, the awkwardness of having to work with your ex. So, yeah, um, I moved to, to now agree with his choice. Hey, y'all in the chat, let us know if you agree with Ash's choice. And that brings us to the end of Trek Table question number three. And those are the last of our Trek Table questions for episode one, uh, season one, episode 15 of this season. 
Amazing. So, final reminder, well, maybe not final reminder, but June 13th, come back and find us on Outside In Theater's YouTube channel. We'll do our season one recap, and uh, we will also start reviewing season two, going through season two of Star Trek Discovery, as we ultimately work our way towards the excitement of season four dropping later this year. So we're super excited. If you're not on our mailing list yet, please find us at trektablepodcast.com. We're about to drop some fun things in the weeks while we're off. And uh, we're super excited to announce that our friend Satterfield H has won the drawing for a new member, oh. new uh, mailing list person that we started at the beginning of the year that we haven't announced yet. So congrats, Satterfield. We'll be in touch uh, since you joined our, our mailing list. So thank you. Um, you were in a drawing and you won. All right. So those are all the things. Follow us. Uh, join us again. Awesome. And join us in the after chat today where we're going to talk about this move and our excitement about season two. All right, and we've reached the, the point in our show called Signal Boost, where we strive to hold space and uplift the voices of black, indigenous, brown women of color. And here are some of the resources that we want to highlight and amplify for the work of women of color who are content creators, community builders, and world shapers. Maya Mama, can I have you share first? Absolutely. We celebrate our friends at the Queer Women of Color Film Festival. The free vir virtual film festival will premiere 19 films in three screenings, June 11th through the 13th, 2021. The 17th anniversary festival focus Molten Connections, forges new relationships, awakens steadfast bonds of diaspora, and sparks a metamorphosis of love that withstands time. All films are subtitled for the death deaf and hard of hearing and ASL interpretation and cart live open uh, captions will be provided live interactive uh, filmmaker QAs and um, the film festival website is uh, festival 2021 uh, dot org, and uh, thank you so much <laughs> awesome yes we're super excited for that film festival uh, Claudia can you share our next signal boost uh, yes, we want to uplift this great reminder from writer Riddy Dastadar. Mutual aid is a radical act. It is not charity. It destabilizes the inequities that structure society by collectively caring for one another while continuing to hold government and those who hold power accountable. So we encourage you to be part of the radical act of mutual aid. Go to uh, www.mutualaidindia.com for curated and vetted lists of opportunities to donate for COVID relief. Yes, thank you. So for folks who are wanting to be in radical mutual aid uh, for some of the vaccine shortages that are happening around the world, um, please uh, go and support that work as well. Uh, Maya, can I ask you to share your signal boost? Yes. Um, 2000. Uh, 21 National Queer Arts Festival presents Central American Unicorns in Space. Connections to the past and to each other have been severed by dark forces that made us forget who we are and where we've come from. Set in the future where borders as we once knew them on Earth no longer exist. So you'll join your host and captain, Maya, that's me, as we travel through the ether tonight, a crew of healers, artists, shapeshifters, and timekeepers using prayers, poetry, movement, and performance to uncover what became of the Central American diaspora. This show, a digital cabaret of sorts, features DJ Femme Papi, Jose Richard Aviles, Roy Guzman, Lula, Lulu Matute, and Celia Sagastume, also known as Astro Sagas. We will um, drop in the, ch the chat and in our notes the links uh, for the uh, Creating Queer Community program that commissioned more than 400 LGBTQ artists to create, produce, and, and promote uh, and document original works examining LGBTQTIA2 S plus social justice and civil rights issues um, that are debuting during this uh, National Queer Arts Festival. And uh, that particular show is June 14th so please mark your calendars and check out their 
queer festival, queer arts festival pass where you can see more than 13 shows with just one pass or you can also uh, buy tickets to individual shows yes yes and we'll drop those links in the chat for both the individual show that maya just talked about as well as the whole festival pass so thank you for that and our final signal boost of the day uh is to invite folks to check out the work by artists at the crenshaw dairy mart home to the artist collective and art gallery dedicated to shifting the trauma-induced conditions of poverty and economic injustice bridging cultural work and advocacy and investing ancestries through the lens of Inglewood, California and its community. To view some of their videos and learn more about the artists involved in their work and their public art, please visit the Crenshaw Dairy Mart com and they've got some work up at mocha here in los angeles um, they just did an artist talk on friday so we do invite folks to check them out uh, if you have a woman of color content creator that you want to amplify let us know and send us a dm at truck table on instagram or at truck table one on twitter uh, and that is our signal boost for truck table episode 16. <laughs> All right, so we are in this final segments of this final episode of season one of the Trek Table, our sweet 16 birthday. Last week was our quinceanera, so we're super excited. We'll have our debut and we come back for season one and maybe a party when we turn 21. We'll see. All right, so <laughs> as is the case with I love parties, so I'm about it. Uh, as is the case every week, we're going to share our final thoughts and I'm going to invite Maya to go first. Your final thought on this episode. I mean, I'm so excited to have finally gotten here. I clearly was so excited that I cut out my practice of only watching one episode a week and went forward because I really want to know what happens with Giorgio. Like, is she really gone? Um, you know, where did Tyler go? Um, but yeah, I mean, I love how she drops these these really biting lines that even though she's comes from this xenophobic world um, where she is the end all be all of everything. There's, there's also some kind of like, she's like a tr crossroads figure as well. Right. Where, where she does, she's not necessarily good or bad. She's, she's, she's a figure there that's kind of pushing us forward to, to think about what we really believe. And so even though um, she says things like, um, you know, uh, Burnham, your you your problem is you instigate and then you second guess yourself. I mean, that's pretty harsh coming from from you know a mother figure, but also something to really think about. Like, what mm -hmm. um, is is this really the way you want to move in the world? You know, or are you also no? You, you're taking a step back um, because you want to really figure things out, but. Yeah, so I'm interested to see if we ha what more there is from her, what more there is from any of these characters. Um, I, 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 I'm just excited always as when they actually go off the ship, um, who else beams onto the ship, and 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 really, um, yeah. I mean, I I, I just want to bu burst through. Um, I want to talk about this season as a whole. The next time we come back, I want to talk about, I want to get into season two already. And, you know, season three was super fun when we were watching that as well. And I can't wait for season four. You know, what, what are we going to do differently on this show um, to, to share that excitement? So, yeah. Amazing. My Thank thoughts. you so much. Awesome. Uh, Claudia, can I invite you to share your final thoughts for this episode? Final thoughts for this episode and um, um, reflections on the season. I would say that um, uh, Star Trek allows me to uh, uh, process the present and dream about the future, and it's always been like a fun, a fun thing to watch to be able to do that. But it's always required so much um, work to make it um, match up to my actual lived experiences. It was all metaphor and illusion. And mm. it's just so freeing and amazing to have a Star Trek 
that just has more direct comparisons to my lived experience mm -hmm. and offers even more um, metaphors and illusions to think about um, why we do things today and how we do things today. If Roddenberry was making this show to help us dream of a new exciting future, uh, I, I feel like that that dream is being lived. Yeah. Final yeah. Thoughts. Thank Ooh. you. Uh, yes, thank you for all of that. Um, Maya Mama, thank you for being a guest host on the show this season. Thank you for, for joining us today, last week, several weeks. Um, your final thought for this episode? Um, this show is a triumph. Um, it is, it's just so good. And I love um, the ability to see uh, more of myself um, and the, and the season wrapped up, uh, uh, so nicely, so neatly. Um, and it gave us a really, uh, a cliffhanger, but I gotta say that this was like a, a, one of those cliffhangers that I found kind of satisfying rather than mm -hmm. frustrating. Um, cause I want to know, I wanted to know when, when it, when it had come out, I did, uh, withhold watching the next episode cause I did want to, um be good but i'm probably gonna watch uh a whole bunch tonight uh okay. i you know um without a doubt i just love how uh responsible they are being with uh with emotions and feelings and 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 how people process that and so uh i love it i love star i love i love star trek and i love this show mm -hmm. yes yes Thank you. And thank you all. I just, I want to give shouts out in my final thought. I want to say thanks to everybody who's tuned in. I know this is just our season one end and this is our read of the season one, episode 15. Will you take my hand? And I just want to say thanks to everybody who decided to take the truck table's hand, who joined us all season, uh, to all our friends in the chat. Uh, thanks to Luz Vamindas, Mac Reddy, Missy Seal, another TV viewer at the end, Bearded Cola, Car Bob, Commander Root, Dark Sky, Doc Zulu, Girly, No Cal and SoCal, Sticky Pigs, Trans Warp Witch, folks who join us every week, uh, I Fing Love Whiskey, Paul 2D2, uh, the Tam Tom, uh, all, all the folks who we get to mention and we don't. Thanks to Janice and Paolo, Diane, Tien, Kate, Satterfield, H, like everybody. So we're just so grateful. And I just want to say that, I, yeah, Claudia, your thought struck me because I do feel that the, this episode, I'm so grateful Maya let me read it in Runway. I love that Giorgio is pansexual or queer. Mm. Um, I find that so... Um, validating or so intriguing to see a strong Asian woman who also is in control of her sexuality and um, certainly problematic in some of these conversations we're having about colonialism and imperialism. But there was something that happened to me when I saw this episode because of what was happening for Burnham and the way in which this story teaches us more about who she is. And then just starting to see the way that she and Giorgio are building uh, with Mira Giorgio and Prime Burnham and what does that mean? So um, I would just ditto. I'm super excited for season two. I'm so grateful to folks who've joined us and I look forward to us being able to continue to expand this convo. And the last thought I have is I just want to, I'm just so grateful to be at Outpost 13 and to have had this time since January to really flush through this season. So thank you to everybody at Outpost 13, to all our fans who've been listening for making a dream come true. I, I'm so humbled by it. Um, and those are our final thoughts on Star Trek Discovery Season 1, Episode 15. Will you take my hand? Thank you all for joining us at the Trek Table. Please don't forget to sign up for our mailing list at trektablepodcast.com you will especially want to be in the know about our move to youtube some of our special guests they're going to be joining us for season two mark your calendars now trek table season two launches on june 13th and yes find your our trek table podcast on itunes spotify google podcasts and wherever you get your podcasts 
And now you can watch, watch us on the video archive. You can like and subscribe to the Trek Table YouTube channel. And don't forget to support us on patreon.com slash trektable. And thank you all. We invite you to like and subscribe to us on Instagram or Facebook at Trek Table and on Twitter at Trek Table One. Join our conversations there and please comment using hashtags, hashtag Trek Table, hashtag B-I-W-C Trek, hashtag Star Trek Discovery, hashtag Claudia is awesome. Hashtag <laughs> Claudia is awesome. Yes, I agree. Ditto de la, as we would say in my, in some circles. All right. So I was actually just about to go there and say, hashtag Claudia is awesome. Hashtag Maya is awesome. Hashtag Maya Mama is awesome. Hashtag Marie Wren is awesome. Hashtag Claire Light is awesome. Hashtag Arthur Wong is awesome. Hashtag Ligaya Sanchez Chan is awesome. We want to say thank you to everybody who's been a host this season with us. We would not be here without you. Much thanks, of course, to today's table, Claudia Alec, Maya Chinchilla, and Maya Mills Low. Hashtag all of you are awesome. We also want to say thank you to everyone for sharing your insights over this last 16 weeks that got us here today. All right, so we're about to close out this ritual for season one. Today we started by holding Trek space. Holding Trek space for all people who are li living in occupied territories as they struggle for their own liberation. Holding Trek space for believers who believe in a better way. Trek space for everyone who is trying to something new and looking for ways to hold each other and connect. Holding Trek space for those finding their way. We're also holding Trek space for those who lead, teach, and model restorative justice. All of this is to say, we'd like to thank the Trek Table production team, our executive producers, Allison Dela Cruz and Luz Viminda Jadiwala, production coordinator, Brandon Chang, artist coordinator, Terry Hashimoto, social media manager, Isil Borlasa, and stage manager, Ariana Michelle. Deep gratitude and thanks to Outpost 13 and their parent organization, Outside In Theater, with extra thanks to Jessica, Paul, Matt, Tamlin, Danny, Arlo, and Alex. Thanks also to Geekish Network, our exclusive partner on Clubhouse. Thanks to Francis and Abe and Visual Communications, and thanks to all of our friends across the Star Trek universes. And I want you to know that Trek Table is a service mark of De La Projects, LLC. And finally, the deepest thank you to you folks joining us on Outpost13.org or live twitch.tv slash Outpost13. That's going to be the last time I say that. Oh, my gosh. And also to all of you listening on our archives, podcasts, uh, and YouTube, thanks for showing up for our conversation centering women of color in Trek. Ah. Yes, and so we just want to say thank you to Outpost thank 13. You to Outpost 13. Thank, thank you, Outpost Twitch. 13. Thank, thank you, Twitch.tv. Twitch. Twitch. Thank you so yes. much for being with us. Thank you for liking and subscribing all the places. It really helps us take off. And yeah, we want to fly, right? Yes, yes. Let's fly, as they say at the end of season three. All right, so we want to say thank you one last time today for coming to the Trek table. We're going to close this ritual with one more breath. So let's go ahead and ground yourself. And take one more big breath in through your nose. And out through your mouth. We hope that you will join us on Sunday, June 13th, as we start season two of the Trek Table on YouTube. We are so excited to see you there. And we're going to keep holding Trek space for you till we get there. Have a great couple of weeks. We'll see you on YouTube soon. Bye.